handle the truth. The Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Rolling Thunder, this is Hitman Seattle. Hitman, this is Rolling Thunder, Seattle. The Denise Simon Experience. Exposing politics, lies, demagoguery, spin, fraud. Great to suppress, Mike Charlie, 435, Niner 21. Great to mark, Mike Charlie, 473, Niner, 8 Niner, out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Denise Simon Experience, heard on Mojo Five O worldwide. Um, I've got the distinct honor of having Craig Olston, Olston with us, who is the co-author of American Restoration, How Faith, Family, and Personal Sacrifice Can Heal Our Nation. Um, it's it's very new at the at the uh, on the book stands on the bookshelves, uh, but you can trot on over to Amazon, and I suggest you do because we all could use some of uh, his expertise and some of his advice. So, um, Craig Olson, thanks for joining us on the Denise Simon Experience. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on today. Congratulations on the book. Um, you know, I have to admit that I have interviewed several authors uh, who have written books of similar um, uh, genre, I should say. Mm -hmm. And it tells me that we're desperate. (laughs) 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 And I don't know how else to put it. So let me let me start it off this way. Um, This might be a real curveball for you, Craig, and I don't mean to do that, but this kind of been bugging me and you're the person to ask. Random acts of kindness by the individual or community or organizations are reported in the media. And when they are, it's almost as though they are reporting it because they're exceptional. That, you know, when they happen, it, 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 it's, it's like it was a fleeting thing and they sort of pop up when in fact I would argue they should be commonplace. Mm -hmm. Um, gestures of kindness, is, is really, I think, part of the American DNA. But, mm-hmm. Craig, it, it's almost as though in the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever that number is, those gestures, those, um, you know, that faith, those personal sacrifices have really been left to government. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that is very much the case. I mean, we have looked at, we have looked to government be the solution yes. for all things, and that's where where we've kind of gone down the wrong road over the last forty to fifty years, as we decided government can take care of the things that normal citizens normally used to do, and what we are called to do, which is to love our neighbors, to treat each everyone with dignity and respect, to see if someone is in need, to come in and out of just because our love for them and as a fellow human being, to help them. And I think the other thing, your example, is I think we're so starved now in our culture for any kind of random acts of kindness that the, what used to be routine is now extraordinary because people are so starved for that. Mm-hmm. We had this little bit of a um, thing that was happening known as pay it forward. And I think, yes. you know, some of the, some of that happens from time to time, but because, you know, it's a random act of kindness, again, it, it's, it should be something that, that happens all the time. So, I, I I think the genesis of your book, the basis of your book, is those Christian values have have been fading away from our culture, from the foundation of what we yeah. are. Mm-hmm. And your argument is it's so easy to get it back if we would just admit it first, right? If we would admit it first, that we acknowledge that this is what's happened, which is why we start the book laying out what those Christian values were that our nation was founded upon. 
and also the idea of religious liberty is because, you know, religion, I mean, um, faith is a civilizing aspect of society. And when we forsake that faith, we start to <laughs> we start to lose that civilizing aspect of our society. But also, we need to engage. I think so much has happened because we have withdrawn and not engaged in our in, in our homes, even if just starting of our homes with our children, you know, with our families, with our neighbors, and so forth. As a result of that, we have lost that, and it has left a big void for government and all these other forces to come in. Mm-hmm. Craig, I'm reminded back in the uh, re-election of uh, Barack Obama when he was running up against um Mitt Romney. There was something that Mitt Romney said at one point on the campaign trail that I've not forgotten. And I think it almost speaks to where you're going. And that is, we have lost the value and the importance of a cohesive family and having family. Um, Because inside that family, so many values are built. And that's just yes. stayed with me the whole time. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think we don't even have the number of families today that we once did because, the, you know, we've got I don't know how many children out of wedlock. I, I, I You know, we the, the mothers are not, you know, the fathers are fleeting, whoever they may be. Uh, and so when I when I hear families, it's kind of like, well, somebody needs to redefine that because I'm not sure we even recognize that that's fractured. Is that right, Craig? Mm-hmm. No, that's correct. I mean, the family is the fundamental unit of society. And when the family goes, you start to get all sorts of issues, all sorts of social pathologies, which we talk about in the book. One of the big wrong turns we took as a country uh, 50, 60 years ago was allowing the government to become the parent in many ways. And it's, and it's, we've, made, we've made so many bad decisions, which on one hand has allowed people to abdicate their, their roles as mothers and, and fathers. We, as a result of that, we've, you know, we have generations now of children who have no idea what a stable home is like. Yes. And every, every study you see out there sh- shows that if a child grows up in a stable family with a mother and a father, you know, I mean, not every home is perfect. I mean, and we're not saying mm-hmm. that, but their odds are so much better when they have that because otherwise they're both parents, play a role in that in that relationship i mean and boys need you know dads to follow uh young girls need you know mothers to follow and and the father also plays a huge role in a girl's life and the mother in a boy's life and when you lose that then you know all sorts of things you know the children will look elsewhere and there's a whole world out there willing to lead them astray which is what we have seen and also when you become dependent upon government and not dependent upon a family unit it leads to the other issues we've 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 seen Mm -hmm. has i'm sure um given your expertise that you you've looked at kind of the map on how we got here but you're also laying out a map on where we need to necessarily go um i think that into itself is the herculean task because we'd have to uh, first of all, we have to unwind a mindset in order to have an admission of these failures and then begin to go forward. So it's kind of a several step process. Is that right, Craig? Yes, it is. And we, we have to persevere. Um, I have a unique perspective in writing this book. I grew up in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. Aye. And so I saw what I, I, I call I saw I saw a sneak preview of coming to track <laughs> and back then and so yes I yeah I saw it all and I saw it all before it hit the rest of America and what I saw was during that time I grew up 
in a little conservative town of Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of San Francisco. It was used, used to being used in movies to be kind of as a double as a Midwest conservative town. And now it's very liberal, like the rest of the Bay Area, and it's forsaken everything. And basically what I saw was those who, you know, oppose our, you know, our Christian values, those, you know, whoever, you know, from a leftist mindset and so forth, they got in and started taking over every institution. And they stayed at the grassroots. They started in the neighborhoods, boards of education, city councils, and so forth, and moved and moved through the process. They took over the ch- so many of the churches. Mm-hmm. What we have to do is realize that we have to persevere as well. And we need to – what they did right <laughs> in, it was they engaged. And they got involved. Well, we, unfortunately, so many of us who believe in our Christian values and who believe in the family sat on the sidelines. And so we are just saying we need to get back engaged in our communities. We need to be talking to our neighbors. We need to get off the computer and have and have interactions with people. I have found, for example, when I when I go back to the San Francisco barracks, I still have families there. I grew up there. I have friends there. I go back to a high school reunion. Uh, I just had my 40th last year. And I've maintained those relationships. Most of my friends, I mean, there's a few, <laughs> there's a few remnant conservatives, Christians left there, but <laughs> most of them, most of them, most of them are liberal. I mean, they have a totally different worldview, but I've engaged with them. I have, I have talked with them with respect and with dignity. And as a result, I have been able to speak into their lives and have an audience and share my viewpoints without them feeling that, and it's changed some of their perspectives um, on things. It's because I've made an intentional reason to a decision to engage rather than withdraw. And that's what we need to do. I think we have a couple of forces that are working against all this. One is political correctness and the Mm -hmm. other is, uh, the smartphone, which puts us into social media, because yeah. you know, with these with these phones, we text, mm-hmm. so we don't we don't hear intonation of voice, we don't see body language, we don't see facial expressions, we text, and yeah. and then we run on over to Facebook, and then people get their feathers ruffled over there, and uh, you know, it's not. It's not a place to engage. You're just kind of exchanging headlines and talking past each other. So Mm -hmm. we have some forces that are part of culture today that are going to be real hard to penetrate. Is that right? Oh, no, I agree. I mean, we've become what's called, I would call a soundbite culture. We are a culture that acts impulsively, that doesn't, we we no longer critically think through things, which is a whole Another issue, but it's because of that, it, it's so easy on Facebook to just re- or a text to respond impulsively and not stop and think. I mean, for me personally, I, I remember when I first got on Facebook, I'm going, oh gosh, I mean, somebody, a friend of mine, you know, I thought was, you know, said something upset to me and I respond and I'm going, after a while, I'm going, this is not, and I would not respond in probably the best way. I'm going, this is probably not the best way for to do this i'm just i'm just inflaming things and so forth i i firmly believe in speaking the truth and and speaking about what i i personally believe in the values i believe in but i have found that it has to happen face to face and so i or i give myself a rule if i see something that upsets me i go okay i'm not going to respond right now (laughs) i'm going to give it a few hours and think of way I can respond appropriately, but it's it's hard in this society because this with the smartphones it does fuel that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost become clinical and cold. There's no more, yeah. you know, uh, human mm-hmm. connection well, here. Right. Well, if you're not interacting with some, someone face to face, it's very easy to fall into your stereotype of that person to begin with. But whether you're on the left or the right, it's very it's it's very easy to just start operating your own little cocoon. And also what we've seen in 
kind of our society, and this is, you can back this up, you know, I mean, um, scholarly research will show this, that people break down into their little tribes, and they don't interact outside of their tribes. And so it just becomes this vicious cycle. So we're telling people is, somebody put down the smartphone. Yes. I mean, except for a call. I mean, it's it's, it's fine to text your wife if you're coming home late for dinner. You know, type of thing. That 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 that's a great, you know, great thing where I'm running late to an appointment, you know. That's where it's good for. But put that put that down and start engaging with your neighbors. Walk outside your doors. I mean, you know, we we talk about how people no longer just engage with their neighbors. I mean, in my our subdivision here in Arizona, I mean, we've made my wife and I have decided we are going to engage with our neighbors, and none of our neighbors around us are Christians. Or, I think you know, one's you know, one across the street is he's conservative, but he's you know, he's a you know, kind of a you know, John Wayne conservative type of guy, good guy. Um, but anyway, he we've engaged with them and built relationships with them, and it's done wonders. Mm-hmm. Well, th- there, I guess if we admit the problem, there are solutions to it. And you and I have just discussed some. You know, first of all, is like maybe just get off of social media for a while. Yes. Uh, well, you know, just stop with the with the with the cell phones. And try something else, like, as you say, go outside. But um, what about education? I mean, we, t- we have changed up the syllabus in the education system so dramatically that we've taken subject matter out of the syllabus, but then yes. the, that that we have left in has almost become clinical uh, to the point where, uh, you know, certain things that should be taught are are just kind of i don't know either not taught at all they're just glossed over right well i agree i mean one of the biggest tragedies we have right now is and you see it amongst and and this has been going on for two or three generations is we we have a society that has no idea how our government works yes no idea of civics we quit teaching civics in schools and and some way i have a i have a statement i share with my team members on one hand and there's some truth to it you can't be responsible for what you don't know and this is unfortunately we have a whole society that doesn't know our our basic you know how our government works you know it doesn't it has no idea the constitution the declaration of independence or any of the any of the principles upon we are founded so how can we expect them to do anything different than go back to basic human instinct or just do what they're going to do out of you know what makes them feel good because they have no they have no idea so we have to get back to teaching civics in school and we talk about that we need to get back and 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 we need to do that in our homes um my my daughter now who's in her late 20s and she has three grandchildren which i used to do with her is i would you know and even though we homeschooled i'd still at dinner tables i would give her civic lessons history Mm -hmm. lessons talk Mm -hmm. about that and she loved that and she just took soaked it up like a sponge so we as parents if it's not happening and I agree it's not happening in our educational system, and we need to change that. But first of all, we need to, as parents, recognize, okay, if our child is in a school system and they're not being taught this, we have to pick up the slack and do it in our homes. Because once our children are educated and, and, and on these principles, I think we would have a major, see a major difference. Over the the weekend, I read in one sitting um, George Washington's Secret Six, the spy ring that saved the American Revolution, written by uh, Brian Kilmeade. Mm-hmm. And I was really struck uh, with the letters that went back and forth but, uh, with George Washington and his, you know, his aides and his, you know, um, military um, circles. Um, those, And it was really striking to me the respect 
and just for who these people were. I mean, they they may yeah. never never have met each other, but there was always a high sense of, um, I guess, honor because these people were doing some significant things. Uh, the, you know, a lot of things were grounded in. Um, you know, divine providence, uh, and, and it was so refreshing to read some of this. Yeah. And as, as I was reading the book, I thought, what goodness, all that's gone. I mean, we, we talk in slangs, we talk in, you know, uh, I guess smartphone language where we don't even spell out a yeah. word anymore. So we're not even giving right. people the time of day. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, uh, you got a lot of work to do here, Craig. <laughs> well, I'm leaving we it to and you. <laughs> we, 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 well, we do. Well, we we have a lot of work to do, but it may seem really bleak right now, but <laughs> there's been a lot of times when things got really bleak that people started to awaken to what's going on, and they've been shaken out of their apathy. They've, been, they've realized we need to take steps to get things back the way they were. So we're praying that this book might be an encouragement and a first step to awaken people and to engage and to bring about that restoration that we all seek. It used to be that schools, um, public schools, certainly in middle school and high school, would bring in speakers and or, or you know have kind of a show and tell. I think that you ought to be on the the short list um, for yeah, making the rounds here, and and speaking to some, because I bet you that would you would be one of their elite guest speakers because I think people are desperate for this and they don't even know it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they are. I appreciate that very much. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I say that in earnest. I, I, <laughs> but uh, I, I, no, I appreciate that. And I, but yeah, it's it, it, people are deep down. They are yearning for this. Yes. They are yearning for a return. They, they're yearning for civility. They're yearning. I mean, you know, the bulk of the nation, you see this. I mean, yes, you're always, throughout society, you're always going to have people on extreme edges. It's just, it's the way human history is. But the bulk of society wants to be civil, to be able to treat with dignity and respect, to have basic moral guardrails that govern society. And they've seeing what's happened when they've gone off the deep end. My wife's parents, um, they're not Christians. I mean, they're, uh, her dad's more conservative than her mom is, but they, are, they agree. They bemoan the lack of what's happened to our society. They go, mm -hmm. why can't we be more civil with each other? And, why, and we need to have these moral guidelines for people and treating people with dignity. So people see it and they across our society they yearn for it but right, right now we have a society that is you know that speaks to those aspects extreme that divide yeah. Us rather we're, we're, than united. yeah it's yeah. it's like the extreme has become vogue now and anything yeah. else that you know where people are necessarily you know, uh, grounded in some kind of Christian values or just values, you know, uh, social values is, has just mm -hmm. faded away. Um, I, I'm so delighted, you know, to have this conversation with you. There's, I think there's a lot more that we could, we could cover. Uh, congratulations on the book. I, I, I want to have you back because I really believe that here in, in the next several months, you'll have some great success with this book. And it'd be fun to hear what kind of interactions you end up having um, with the readers, with those that have bought the book. And they would necessarily tell you a story. You think that's possible? I would love to be back. And just please let me know. And it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Hmm? Well, um, good luck with this. Uh, I think it's a good analysis, and, and you know, we've covered a lot here, but um, I'd be very interested to hear some uh, reviews because I, I think uh, I'm giving you high praise right now. So there, <laughs> there you Thank go. You. But, um, Thank you. Um, thanks for being with us. Uh, the book is American Restoration. Um, it can be found on Amazon. Please go grab it. We've been speaking with uh, Craig Olston, uh, the co-author. 
Congratulations again, ladies and gentlemen. Stay with us because there's more coming your way on Mojo Five O. Thanks so much, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us here on the Denise Simon Experience, heard worldwide on Mojo 5 so we're glad you're along with the ride. But also joining us on this ride is a distant friend, previous guest, um, who is Claire Lopez. Claire is a former operations officer with the CIA, and she, I think, was a weapons of mass destruction expert kind of person. Um, but now she's the vice president of research and analysis for the Center for Security Policy, and the topic really is Iran and their weapons of mass destruction. So, Claire, long time no talk to, and welcome. Well, thank you, Denise. I'm very glad to be back with you again. Thanks, thanks. Um, we have some admissions by the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency that says that Iran has exceeded uh limitations now does that mean yeah. mean that the iaea actually did some inspections or that iran just said yeah sure what what uh, happened there so so apparently um it just to, just to, to to set the stage for every, uh, everyone who's listening um under the july 2015 uh iran nuclear deal or joint comprehensive plan of action jcpoa um the iranians agreed to limit uh, their enrichment of uranium to the level of 3.67% enrichment, which is a very low level of enrichment. Uh, but it was a huge concession just allowing them to enrich at all, which never should have been made. Um, and, and other limits were, were put on them. But the thing is that, you know, Denise, as you're mentioning, uh, the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency or the United Nations Monitoring Group, uh, for for nuclear programs around the world, um, the the IAEA uh, nor any other inspectors uh, have ever mm-hmm. been allowed into the sites that Iran calls off limits or secret sites or military sites. Uh, so I mean, if you're driving for the development of a nuclear weapon and building nuclear warheads, which Iran is, of course, where would you put them? The places where they are allowing allowing the IAEA to go? <laughs> or in the bunkers and tunnels under mountains and uh, underground. So in this case now, um, uh, yesterday, that is the uh, the 8th of July here, 2019, um, Iran, uh, according to its uh, prior announcement, uh, began to enrich uranium to 4.5%. So you can see it's breaking the limit uh, by not a whole lot, uh, but the limit uh, of the JCPOA. And the IAEA uh, uh, acknowledged, I mean, they made the statement um, that they had uh, been there on the ground um, and and um, verified that that is indeed the case, that Iran is now enriching up to 4.5%. But, of course, the IAEA can only go where Iran lets it go. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's it's kind of silly, um, you know, but that that's what's going on. Uh, as a conspiracy theorist, or perhaps somebody who just has to ask questions that never get asked, um, is this a re- recent activity of um, uh, new enrichment, or has perhaps Iran been enriching all along and they just decided to kind of put their hands on their hips and stomp their feet and go, "Ha ha! See, we're we're already yeah. enriching." So, so a bit, a bit of a bit of history, a small bit here, just um, to set the stage again is that um, the Ayatollah Khomeini, before he died, back in 1988, gave the order to his IRGC, that's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is in charge of all of Iran's WMD programs. Yes, that's plural, chemical, biological, and nuclear, and its ballistic missile uh, programs, gave the order to the IRGC to essentially get the bomb. Mm -hmm. From that point all the way until August of 2002, that's something like 14 years, 
Iran worked on a nuclear weapons program in secret. It was helped by North Korea, Pakistan, China, and who knows who else. Uh, and uh, in 2002, the Iranian opposition group, the National Council of Resistance of Iran, it's the largest, um, best organized, most committed democratic uh, Iranian opposition group, which has a tremendous network inside of Iran, blew the lid off of the Iranian nuclear weapons program publicly for the first time and revealed uh, the existence of that program in certain locations like Natanz, uh, the underground enrichment site where they put uh, centrifuges, uh, Isfahan, um, the um, conversion site, Iraq, the plutonium uh, reactor site, etc. And many more revelations came from the NCRI after that point. So we know that Iran has been working on a nuclear weapon mm -hmm. for a very long time. We're coming up on something like 30 years, I guess. Um, the other point um, to note here is that before the IAEA sort of uh, got got muffled, got muzzled. Um, in November of 2011, and people can look this up online, put out a quarterly report, which it still does, a quarterly report on the Iranian nuclear program on its website at the IAEA. And it, it explained in great detail exactly how Iran was working. This is November 2011 on nuclear warheads. Mm -hmm. Now, that included um, not just the core, the pit, the, the, uh, the uh, enriched uh, uranium, milled uranium core of the whole thing, but also the explosive devices that are needed from the external side of it to, to set off the implosion sequence. All of that's in that report. So what I'm saying here by way of this history is they've been at this for a long, long time. And again, I go back again. Once the NCRI revealed certain of Iran's there to four secret sites, made them public, the Iranians did exactly the kind of deceit and denial, D&D, &D, that the Soviet Union, the KGB, taught them way back when. Um, and that is, uh, once you're exposed at a certain place, turn that place into a showcase and say, oh, come look, this is, this is, you know, everybody's welcome, the journalists, the science, scientists, the IAEA, the inspectors, come look. And of course, then the actual program itself gets moved someplace else. Hmm. I mean, again, my question, where would you put your nuclear weapons program if your sites have been revealed? Well, you're going to go find some other sites. And that's what they've done. So back to your question of, is this the first time? No, of course it's not the first time. They've been enriching uranium for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have any good uh, estimate, really, because of the secrecy, because of the D&D, &D, because of the failure of the IAEA and the world powers to, to press, to insist that Iran open up its sites. We don't have a good idea of exactly how much they have enriched or how many warheads they actually have built, but guaranteed they have built warheads. Which is sounds to me part and parcel of the reason that, I guess it was early last year, time does fly, of when the Israelis had some operatives and got into a warehouse and found the treasure trove of documents to yes. uh, get the evidence. Right. So... Uh, what happened uh, going back to 2002 after the National Council of Resistance of Iran opposition group made that first big revelation, the Iranian regime kind of went to panic stations and they quickly tried to hide away uh, those critical elements of their nuclear weapons program to safeguard them because they knew that at that point they would have to allow for the first time the IAEA to come in and investigate at least something. Mm. So they had to clean up places. They had to uh, uh, allow places to become those showcases while the real program went elsewhere in hiding. Um, and so um, what they did is began a program that we now understand uh, much more about, the Ahmad program, um, because uh, the Iranian opposition helped the Israelis um, to learn about this storage site, a warehouse kind of a building in Tehran, uh, where the Iranians had stashed a bunch of their documents and also things like hard drives and, you know, computer um, uh, hard drives, disks, and so forth, um, had stashed them away, but that it had documented in great detail uh, what that nuclear weapons weapons 
program looked like. Now, the the uh, the knowledge of of that site became known in 2016. Uh, the okay. Israelis raided the site in 2017. Okay. okay. That is right after they realized that Donald Trump would be president and would back them up. And uh, <laughs> it took about a year or so until early 2018 when Prime Minister Netanyahu did finally make that announcement, announcement. that video, right, um, after they had had uh, a good, you know, year or nearly a year um, of time to do the translation and see what they actually had in hand. So the the, the time schedule goes back a little bit further than I okay. thought. But, but that warehouse and what they found in it, and, and they only got away with a portion of it. It's not even all of it, but enough, plenty enough um, to realize that Iran never did give up um, its, its um, quest for a deliverable nuclear weapons capability. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's orders were never, ever revoked. Uh, and that program to develop deliverable nuclear weapons continues to this day. Um, last week, uh, there was a piece that I ended up kind of republishing, um, where in part of the uh, outcome of the comprehensive joint plan of action that Iran was supposed to send some heavy water out and some uh, over inventoried stock of uranium. And the uranium was to get on a ship and head to St. Petersburg, Russia. Mm -hmm. There was some testimony by Ambassador Lull, I think was his name, or Mull, I forget which, something like that, <clears throat> before Congress. And Congress was asking him, did that uh, uranium actually get to Russia? Well, we don't know. <laughs> well, how would we? You know, I mean, the IAEA <laughs> is not on the ships that supposedly carry this stuff out of Iran to its close BFF uh you know buddy uh in 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 moscow or st petersburg um now let's remember that um nobody uh has worked closer together than the kgb with the iranian regime the current supreme leader ayatollah khamenei of course is a graduate of patrice lumumba university in mm -hmm. moscow mm -hmm. currently called um Friendship University. So um, <laughs> that was the deal. That was that was what was supposed to happen uh, under the terms of the JCPOA. But look, I mean, Iran is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Remains so to this day. It's violated that agreement all of these years. Why on earth would anybody expect them to abide by the terms of the JCPOA? So um, right under the under the terms, uh, they were supposed to send their overproduction. Hmm of uh, heavy water and of uh, uranium, enriched uranium, uh, out of the country. Um, who knows what they did with it? And nobody's I mean, no followed idea. up in Congress. Nobody. No, I know that no, the United no, States was supposed know. to have gotten some heavy water, but the uranium, I, you know, it's, it's remarkable that where is everybody? They don't want to know. They're scared to death, I think, by what the Israelis are telling them, because it's pretty bad. Uh, and, and recall again that the Iranian regime has what amounts to essentially a joint venture uh, with North Korea, yes, with yes. the Kim Jong-un regime there, which we know for a fact has ICBMs with the range to reach the United States, continental United States, has the capability to miniaturize warheads, to put those warheads, fit them to the nose cones of those ICBMs, we know that the North Korean regime has EMP, that's Electromagnetic Pulse weapon, uh, Weapons Technology. There is no reason to think with this joint venture between Pyongyang and uh, Tehran uh, that any of that technology um, has not been shared. I'm sure for a price, they pay for it. Uh, the Iranians pay for it. But uh, there's no reason anybody would have to, to, to think that that's not been shared completely. Does that mean that the Iranians have exactly the same capabilities yet that the North Koreans do? No, but certainly the technology will have been shared. And oh, by the way, uh, the Iranians have uh, learned how to MIRV their nuclear warheads. That's multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. It just means multiple warheads on the same delivery missile device. So, um, yes, Congress fun knows talking all of to this. you. <laughs> Congress knows all of this. Yes, um, and but, so does Europe. Uh, 
which takes me to my next question. Uh huh. I've just you have just been nominated to be part of an envoy um, to go over to France, uh, Germany, and Britain, and say, "Hey, you guys are still signatories to this. Let uh-huh. me tell you why you're so stupid." What are you going to tell them? Well, I think I probably would not open the discussion with this is why you're so stupid, but (laughs) what I might want to convey to them is this this record now of open source documentation that we all have um, available to us that dates back quite a long time now, meaning decades, um, that shows incontrovertible evidence that Iran is absolutely uh, pursuing a nuclear a deliverable nuclear weapons capability. And that doesn't this worry the Iranians, uh, I mean, uh, the Europeans, which are Mm. geographically a lot closer um, to Iran than the United States, although I'm not sure that makes a huge amount of difference. Um, But the Iranians, of course, are still trying to persuade uh, the parties to the JCPOA. Those would include the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, Russia and China don't need persuading um, us, which I think they've given up uh, on the United Mm. States, uh, not persuadable. But that leaves um, the U.K. and France uh, plus Germany, not not a a U.N. Security Council member, but the plus one of that of that formulation. Germany uh, trying to persuade them to somehow uh, stick with the deal such that uh, they would they would still be allowed to or not allowed it's against uh, the sanctions that the United States has imposed very strict sanctions uh, but they they would try to find some vehicle around a financial vehicle around those sanctions which hasn't worked out very well by the way yet but this is the motivation primarily of the Europeans it's trade I mean they want they want business with Iran it's lucrative but. President Trump, to his great credit, has, has offered the Europeans and everyone else mm. a, a simple binary choice. You can do business with Iran or you can do business with the United States, but you can't do both. So um, France, Germany and Britain have this uh, back channel payment system that they have set up in in tex, mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. That's what they call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I would argue that that was probably a brainchild of John Kerry, but that's a sidebar. Um, but it is are they, those three countries really uh, using trade as an excuse because they don't really have any kind of defense systems, and they're in fear that if they, uh, I mean, the United States does for the most part, but you know, Europe doesn't. So is Europe in fear that? Um, if they don't hold hands with Iran, that um, they could be a new target? I, 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 I don't think they, they even uh, grasp that. Number one, okay. Okay. both Britain and France are nuclear powers. Yep. Um, but, but number two, I don't think they even think in those terms. Term, I don't um, either. Because Iran has tried so hard to... Um, you know, to, 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 to butter them up, as it were, to, to uh, uh, make a relationship with Iran uh, as attractive as possible. And, you know, threat of, of nuclear holocaust um, probably is, is not part of that persuasion package. But it is foolish, beyond foolish, of, of, of those ad- administrations, those governments in Europe, Britain, France, Germany, to ignore uh, the threat that Iran poses. Um, and I, and I just wonder how many of their leadership or anyone, um, you know, has read the Iranian constitution, which is in English online and states very clearly that the Iranian regime exists for the purpose of fighting jihad to spread Islam across the entire world, establish a global Islamic state under rule of Islamic law, and it says in its constitution that the IRGC is an ideological army whose job is to fight jihad, not just defend the borders of Iran. Hello. Everything that the Iranian regime is doing is in keeping with their own constitution. I mean, I, I, I just don't know how much more clear it could possibly be what their intentions are and the acquisition of a nuclear weapons capability 
as well as their chemical and biological weapons, which are equally horrific, by the way, it's all part of that uh, constitutional uh, expression of, of, of their national uh, goals, their object, the regime. Now, I shouldn't say national. It's not national. It's regime goals. Mm. And, you know, with with the power that they have exerted over Syria, they've essentially won that territory um, with the power that they've exerted over uh, Lebanon. Same thing. And um, I would argue they've done, pretty much done that with Iraq, except that they're not quite as yet successful with Iraq because the United States is still there. Um, that's a sidebar. Now, well, let me ask. It's important, though. Uh, you're, you're right. Yeah. It up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, what I'll just say really quickly about that, um, that, that the, the key primary modus operandi of this Iranian regime in Tehran, uh, is, is not only to build up at home domestically its WMD and ballistic missile capabilities, uh, but to operate regionally and above and beyond through proxies. And so, um, Yemen. the establishment of, of, of proxy forces in all of those countries you just mentioned, um, first of all, with the purpose of surrounding uh, Israel, and and so you've got Hamas being uh, aided, funded, aided, uh, you know, abetted, armed, trained by Iran in Gaza. Uh, you have Hezbollah, the primary and the first and the largest and the best, um, you know, trained and equipped uh, Shiite Islamic terror force um, out of Lebanon to the north of Israel's borders. But now, as as you mentioned, and since you know, the revolt against Bashar al-Assad in Damascus broke out in 2011. Um, the, 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 the spread of Iran's proxy forces has gone further. Mm. And it is now with the intent, very obvious intent, of surrounding the entire Arabian Peninsula. So look right. at the geography in your mind's eye if you need. Um, you, you, you not only have, I mean, let's go clockwise, right? So you, you not only have Hamas in Gaza, uh, you have Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon. Uh, you have uh, whatever is left, uh, the remnants of the Bashar al-Assad regime in Damascus, still being supplied by Iran, presence of Iranian forces uh, in uh, the, the territory that is still controlled by Damascus, keep coming around. Uh, you've got Iran itself, and you mentioned, Denise, Iraq, and I think that's extremely important because there are uh, proxy Shiite terror forces in Iraq mm -hmm. directly under the control of Major General Qasem Soleimani, who is the commander of the Quds Force, a subordinate element of the IRGC, he directly commands those units. They're sometimes called uh, Popular Mobilization Units, PMUs. You might have heard the term also Hashd Shabi. Same thing, uh, Shiite terror militias. Those militias are now being incorporated formally into the Iraqi army. They're and, still under and government, right? And government as well. Other other groups like the Badr Corps, for example, mm. dominate the government of Baghdad and the internal uh, interior ministry. And then uh, we have the Yemen ministry. And then you come around to complete that that clockwise movement. You come to Yemen, and why is Yemen important? Not just for Yemen, uh, although the poor people there are suffering suffering awfully, uh, but because of its geographic position, which is astride or right right on what's called the Bab el Mandeb. It is an incredibly important strait that sits a waterway, narrow waterway, that sits between the Arabian Peninsula and the continent of Africa. It is, in fact, right uh, across from Djibouti. But that is the entrance um, into the Red Sea on up to the Suez Canal and thereby, you know, to the Mediterranean. So controlling that access point, just as Iran currently doesn't control, but it certainly is able to threaten the Strait of Hormuz on the other side of the Arabian Peninsula uh, between uh, Iran and and uh, the, the Arabian Peninsula directly across from Oman specifically. But but that, that, that surrounding, this is what I'm getting at, the geographical attempt to surround the Arabian Peninsula and also to be in a position to threaten these critically important waterways Mm -hmm. uh, the Strait of Hormuz and the Babel Mandeb are two of the eight most critical straits in the entire world. Changing gears just a little bit, we've got a couple of minutes left, and that is um, we have the limpets that uh, were attached to various oil tankers. 
-hmm. And then we had a very sophisticated drone that was shot out of the sky. Yes. Um, The go order was given. I was watching carefully all night for the United States to respond. And at the very last minute, the um, switch was turned off. Should Trump have bombed the key Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps targets because of the drone? Well, there, there are various arguments about this, and, and uh, I am not um, privy to the arguments that went on inside of the Trump administration or at the National Security Council, but I will say this. Uh, even though the, the, um, the uh, Trump administration uh, took the decision to strike back hard, forcefully, with uh, a cyber uh, response, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that definitely had an effect, um, uh, you know, on, on the Iranian regime. They knew where that attack came from. They know the damage it did. Even though, um, you know, other actions have been taken, additional sanctions, those specific sanctions, for example, uh, put on um, uh, the supreme leader himself, Ali Khamenei, directly um, impeding his ability to access his gazillions and billions of dollars kept in overseas banks, like Swiss banks, bank accounts, uh, and the bank accounts also of other senior IRGC commanders. Um, that was done, and it's effective, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a very serious expression, and, and it has serious effects um, on their ability to, to move and to use their money. Um, that all said, um, I think for the tough neighborhood that, that Iran is part of, um, there needs to be something visible uh, for example, every time um, the Iranian regime tries to send, um, you know, high-tech gear through Damascus airport to be given off to Hezbollah, for example, you know, um, uh, precision guidance uh, systems for Hezbollah missiles against Israel, Israel uh, takes the steps of, of, of attacking that transfer point or the warehouse mm-hmm. or wherever those things are stored. Uh, it's visible. It is effective. It destroys actual equipment that would be used to, to, to strike and to harm Israel. Uh, and by the way, you notice Russia does not intervene with anti-aircraft <laughs> right. defense, right? Right. right. And that happens. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I think that's an important point to make. Russia's objectives in the region are not identical to Iran's at all and does not include whatsoever uh, the annihilation of the Jewish state of Israel, which is part and parcel absolutely of the regime in, in Tehran's uh, objectives. But should we have, I think that it's going to come to that no matter what, um, simply because the Iranians have gotten away with so much for mm-hmm. so long. Um, going back to Beirut in 1983, the Marine Corps barracks bombing, uh, going to its alliance with al-Qaeda, going to the Kobar Towers attack, going to the East Africa Embassy attack, going to the USS Cole attack, going to 9-11, for which they have never, ever been held hey, uh, accountable. They have this sense of impunity. And until that sense of impunity is broken in a very physical and visible way, uh, I think that they will keep pushing uh, and they will try to find out where the limits are. And the further it goes, the further those limits go, and the harder and the more violent um, the response is going to have to be than if we had taken steps in the very first, in the beginning, mm-hmm. um, to, to, to put this stuff down and just to call a halt to this and draw a red line and mean it. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause to uh, Claire Lopez. Thanks for all of this in context. We certainly needed it. And um, excellent work. And ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way. So make sure you stay with us on Mojo Five O. the truth the denise simon experience the truth matrix Fennec exposing drilling down to the truth rolling thunder this is hitman see ya hitman this is rolling thunder see ya now the denise simon experience exposing politics lies demagoguery spin fraud Mike Charlie, 435-921, great to mark. Mike Charlie, 473-9-8-9-er, out. Promoting individual.
individual situational awareness. Question. Probe. Notice. Ask why. Mark smoke on the deck. Two rounds HEVT. Cast TOT 5 for you. And now, the Denise Simon Experience. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Denise Simon Experience. I have with us Vladimir Bukovsky, who is the author of Judgment in Moscow. Um, This book was written uh, many, many years ago and just recently fully translated into English. And it's based on the secret records that um, Vladimir was able to get from the Soviet archives. Uh, So it is quite the read. So, uh, Mr. Bukovsky, thanks so much for being with us on the Denise Simon Experience. You're welcome. Um, your premise in this in the uh, book is uh, Nuremberg was the trial for Nazism, but uh, your argument here, and I would agree with you, is that the Soviets, and now I would say the Russians, uh, their crimes are really just as bad, but they have never really been punished criminally, right? That's right. Um, they never been. They never been even judged decisively. You see. Uh, well, is it because there's so many entities? I mean, would it be just KGB or the military or those within the Kremlin? I mean, how would that have necessarily worked if if there could be some criminal case? Well, they were all united in the same project, so to speak. It's also the party, which was leading force in the Soviet system, and then military, KGB, whatever. All the system was working to, for the same goal, for the same purpose. And in doing so, it committed crimes every day. Sometimes international, sometimes internal. All of them uh, come up to uh, a crime against humanity. Yeah, uh, indeed. Um, in some of those crimes, uh, I mean, we, we can't even begin to necessarily list them all, can we? Um, because they go from meddling in elections to criminals to murders to um, robbery to theft. Um, I mean, the, the, the crimes are, are war criminals, I would also add. Is, is there anything else that I have omitted there? Well, the, the first and foremost from my viewpoint, is a genocide crime. They started with uh, uh, eliminating, destroying their own nation, their own country. They, in the first years, they destroyed all other classes, as they called them. Uh, let them be the uh, clergy, the intellectuals, the whatever, you know including the most successful uh, peasants, most successful uh, uh, tradesmen. It it was massive. It was millions upon millions. Uh, Then they launched uh, the wars. They occupied the neighboring countries, and they would do exactly the same in these countries as they did in their own. It was kind of... uh, uh, social engineering. They were changing the fabric of society because their uh, the proclaimed goal was to change the the human society. They were introducing, uh, as they used to say, the, the creating a new man, a Soviet man, and that was their proclaimed objective. And in doing so, they committed uh, genocide in many countries, starting with their own. Now, you spent time more than once in a Russian gulag, correct? Yeah, about 12 years. And how did that come to be? Because you were, uh, you know, you were a dissident or you were against the regime. Why were you in a gulag? (laughs) When I started being um, uh, imprisoned, there were no such idea as dissidents. It, it formed later. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first uh, imprisonment was for possessing a forbidden book. 
which uh, uh, was published abroad. And, uh, I just managed to get a copy to read. So someone denounced it to the KGB, and they came and found this book. So it was Article 70 of Penal Code of Russian Federation. Up to seven years of imprisonment plus five years of internal exile. That's maximum sentence. So this was my beginning. The dissidents as, as a phenomenon uh, appeared later. Mm -hmm. Mostly uh, from people like myself who uh, have this trouble with political system one way or another. Vladimir, how did you eventually make it from um, uh, to, to Cambridge, England, out of um, the Soviet <laughs> Union? Yeah, that's, that's a very long way. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no, I was in and out of jails and lunatic asylums and labor camps. And the case was becoming kind of notorious, very, very, very well known abroad. So there were some groups of people who were campaigning on my behalf. Uh, and uh, it all culminated by 1976, uh, when, as you remember, in Chile, the Pinochet regime was holding some leading communist socialists and so on in jail. Mm -hmm. So well, someone suggested to exchange me with the leading communist in Chile, who was in jail at that time. So they had this kind of a prisoner swap, which took place in Zurich, in Switzerland, and uh, we went our ways. She went to Soviet Union, uh, and I stayed in the West. And we're very happy for that. Um, in all of this, you ended up traveling back to to uh, Russia, and you were able to take a fairly new piece of technology with you that the Russians really didn't understand. And right in front of the, under their noses, you were copying documents out of the Soviet archives. Is that right? Yes, well, first time I could go to to Soviet Union uh, was 1991, before the Soviet system collapsed, but for a very short period. And my my uh, suggestion to the new Russian government was that we should stage a Nuremberg type style, because nothing else would do, bearing in mind the scope of the crimes committed. And they kind of agreed with me, but it never came to that. Ultimately, in 1992, uh, because the, the new Russian government uh, banned the Communist Party, uh, the Communists uh, protested. They sued the President Yeltsin in constitutional court, arguing that the decision to ban their party is unconstitutional. <laughs> and that's when uh, the, the government asked me to come and help them with this trial. Mm. I was officially appointed uh, to be expert at Constitutional Court of Russian Federation. And in that capacity, I had power to subpoena the secret documents from the Kremlin archives. Uh, so I did as much as I could. And indeed, because the copying of these documents were, was forbidden, I brought the laptop computer and handheld scanner, which at that time was not known in Russia. It, it was not very well known in the West either. Mm -hmm. It was just appearing from some experimental uh, institutions. I managed to get one through some friends. And uh, in the rules dealing with secret documents in the Soviet Union at that time, in Russia as well, there was no mentioning of scanning. Uh, they, they went through copying, through, you know, f uh, photographing, things like that, xeroxing, and it all was forbidden. But they didn't mention scanning because at that time when they composed these instructions, there was no scanning. 
So I use this loophole and I've uh, scanned thousands of documents as long as I could manage uh, and uh, brought them out. Ultimately, I've written a book based on these documents, which is kind of a post-mortem of communist system, explaining how it was functioning, why and how it died, and things like that. It's a very big book, consisting mostly of the documents or quotes from, from the secret documents. Some of these documents are, are still secret, because when the trial was over, uh, all the documents I've seen, uh, which were produced to Constitutional Court, uh, were qu classified again. Uh, so they were opened only for the, for the purposes of court case. And they're classified now. So uh, I thought it would be of interest to the world to know how and why this system died and how it did manage to survive for so long. <clears throat> this has somewhat almost been your life's work, is that right, Vladimir, is to, is to explain to everybody, uh, countries outside of Russia, what Russia was about and essentially is still about? Well, I tried my best. I mean, uh, I was not under obligations to do that. It was kind of moral duty. Uh, it pained me to see how how uh, pathetic the Western efforts to cope with the uh, Soviet threat was, how they misunderstood the system and didn't know what to do with it. So it, I felt like, like obliged morally to help them to explain what's happening because they didn't understand the system at all. And they still don't. So anyway, I've spent a lot of efforts <laughs> and years trying to explain it patiently and uh, only in some cases I succeeded but mostly I, I failed. Uh, it's very difficult for anyone who never lived under such system even to grasp the essence of it. Uh, so people like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan with whom I was friends, they understood but most of people didn't. So. I've asked I, a, it, I, I, I have asked. A, I have asked a few people here in the United States. Um, I've mentioned your name, and they all said, "Oh yes." So you are um, well known here, at least in the United States. Now, whether your work is necessarily read and understood, that's another issue. But um, you're certainly be, to be congratulated on on this work. Um, Vladimir, with what you're seeing going on today with what the Russians are doing worldwide, it's really the same kind of model um, going back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, correct? Well, to some extent, yes. You see, the problem is, since we never staged the Nuremberg type trial in Moscow, didn't uh, uh, judge the system as criminal, didn't... Uh, I didn't clean the uh, the governing uh, bodies of people who committed these crimes. Uh, it very quickly went back. Mm -hmm. the, the the job was not finished, you know. Mm -hmm. Although we tried, we pre tried to persuade people that it must be done, but for some uh, reasons it did not uh, happen. The government of Russia was not interested in. Uh, uh, having such a, uh, a trial, uh, the number of people involved in the crimes of communism is huge. Mm. It's, don't forget that the membership of Communist Party at the end was up to 18 million people. So obviously it was not uh, a task to all of them being, uh, to, to proclaim them all guilty. <laughs> so the task was just to for the people to look into their own souls and to uh, repent, to understand what they did contribute to. And they were part of a huge, uh, horrible crime. And to rethink, to, to repent, you know. 
And that, that was, by the way, the result of Nuremberg trial and denazification process in Germany after the war. And it did succeed. German, Germany uh, completely was re- reborn with, with these notions. <coughs> and the, the risk of uh, Nazism coming up again in Germany is close to zero. Well, uh, since in the Soviet Union nothing like that happened, and it, didn't, it wasn't finished, lots of the people involved in these crimes remained where they were in the same position of power, uh, uh, the system very quickly fell back into the same yes. uh, modus operandi as they used to have. Mm. And uh, the modern leaders in Kremlin, they they kind of uh, nostalgic for Soviet past. They want to return this degree of control over internal life, the, their sphere of influence abroad. That's why they suddenly became very aggressive and uh, making troubles to their neighbors. There, there one big idea which actually drives the government today is to restore Soviet Union as much as they can. They do understand it's impossible to restore completely, but at least in as as much as they can achieve it, they try. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's what they observe. Therefore, what you say is correct. I mean, the system functioning today is remarkably similar to what we used to have on the communist system. And their propaganda machine still operates uh, as it as it once did, or always did. But they have the a problem. new they have a new platform, which is certainly the internet. So, I mean, the internet gave them an additional boost in propaganda. So they cause global chaos, and they're supposed to be the the good guy in the end, which, of course, is propaganda, correct? Well, the propaganda was always a huge part of the activity. And the uh, Internet obviously helps now, but in previous years, starting with uh, 1917, they would use newspapers, they would use radio, which was at that time a new medium, and very influential. Then they would use television, you know, they, they were following the, the development of the modern technology and always using its, uh, its uh, latest achievements. So there is no surprise they try to exploit the internet and the computers. <laughs> Vladimir, are you still doing uh, research today, or you've been asked to speak um, because of your uh, resume and your background? Well, unfortunately, I'm very ill for the last uh, about five years. I'm so much ill that I can't leave my house. I live in a wheelchair. So, uh, no, I mean, the last thing I did was, was this kind of publication. Uh, which also took 25 years to be uh, translated to published in in English. Mm. I did publish the book actually in uh, uh, 1995. It was published in France, in Germany, in Italy, and so on. But in English language, it was blocked, mostly by the left wing, which didn't like uh, the revelations uh, which followed from the documents published. <laughs> and they were resisting the publication of this book in English for 25 years. So now it suddenly became possible. Some uh, volunteers helped me in the United States. They created a small publishing house and did everything themselves. Uh, and as a result, they've got this book published finally. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the book is not new. It was published 25 years ago, first time. Unfortunately, it is as timely as it was 25 years ago, because of dealing with the same system. <laughs> the system did not evolve in these 25 years. Mm-hmm. Not, not, to, uh, not to the degree that it would be uh, obsolete to, to read these documents. Do you have, uh, uh, have you safeguarded documents, you know, hard copies, or do you have 
documents that are not included in the book in your possession? Well, all the documents I finally uh, placed on the Internet. Uh, that was done in 1999, I okay. think. Uh, so uh, you can find them on the Internet if you type my name, my uh, name and the uh, title Soviet Archive will come up. So connected to my name. So that is where I placed all of them and they were available ever since then. But they were in Russian, in original language, mm -hmm. these documents, as I scanned them. <coughs> and of course only the specialists could read them. Um. You also have an argument in your book, and I fully agree that, you know, Hollywood and media and education always seem to be uh, Soviet sympathizers, and they kind of perpetuated, um, or I would say censored in a lot of things that we necessarily, the West, needed to know. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I witnessed. I was surprised at how little awareness in the West was of the dangers of the Soviet system, of socialist experiments. The people were not aware of it, and no one was to explain it to them. The proponents of this idea would argue, if you tried to open the eyes of people, they would argue that you engage in propaganda, mm. and there is no proof to it. So that's why I've collected all the proofs, as much proof as it could be, the documents, the authentic documents. Of, of the Kremlin and tried to publish them and even then the left was kind of blocking it everywhere they could. Do you uh, feel so it, do you feel threatened today because of uh, the book being published in English? No, of course not. I mean, before being published in English, it was published in a dozen of countries, okay. in a dozen of languages. So it makes no sense now to do anything. Besides, I'm very ill, not uh, active. I don't go promoting it anywhere. Yeah, I can't. So it's, uh, I think it's of little danger to them. I think yeah. the, the Western West will be much more angry with this book than the Soviets. The Soviets, the Russians. Uh, now, uh, more or less indifferent to the past. They don't want to discuss it. Well, we're trying to help you promote the book over here in the United States. I'm not sure about Europe, but um, we're certainly trying to help you promote the book in a, in a big way. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I have to congratulate you because this took a lot of energy. I mean, it just took day in and day out dedication to this project, correct? Well, I mean, once you've taken something on yourself to do, you have to see it through. At least that's how I was brought up. So uh, it's, uh, I felt unfinished business. And I'm very happy that my friends and some uh, well-wishers decided to finalize this uh, project and publish it in English. Well, it is quite the read, ladies and gentlemen. You can find his book on Amazon. Um, Vladimir Bukowski, Judgment in Moscow, um, certainly translated in English, and quite the read, um, quite the lesson in history to the point where you can apply so much of it of what's going on today in the world. Um, Mr. Vladimir, stay well, and thank you very, very much for being with us. Uh, we wish you great success uh, with the with. Uh, the book getting some more traction and people understanding um, this piece of history. So uh, a job well done, and thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way on the Denise Simon Experience. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us here on the Denise Simon Experience, heard worldwide on Mojo Five O. Well, uh, 
this immigration thing, this immigration thing. It just, it's, it, 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 I don't know. It's, it exacerbates itself. So what do I do? I call in my little buddy, Rachel Bovard, who is over at the conservative um, partnership Institute, because she's my little contact on the Hill. And she's got a thing going on for Ocasio, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and rightly so. Um, so now I guess we're going to implode the Department of Homeland Security. But um, welcome, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, look, somebody, Nancy Pelosi seems to be trying to pull some of these, uh, this little click that we have aside and say, look, girls, but these girls have dug in their heels because now they're accusing Nancy Pelosi of being racist. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's right. Everything is racist now. Everyone everything. agrees with them is a, is a racist is what the prevailing wisdom from this group seems to be. Okay. But in the meantime, it's hard to look for things that are not there. And the reason they're not there is because the Democrats have no interest in some things. And, and so they're not proposing anything. Uh, they're not proposing, you know, something on the victims of crimes against, um, you know, I mean, these victims it, it, uh, are at the hands of illegals that have done crazy stuff. Um, sanctuary cities uh voting for money for border patrol to upgrade and keep supplied uh, detention facilities i mean it just goes on and on and on why can't we seem to have some kind of a hearing where our little click of the ocasio cortez led envoy here are given some real lessons so they can be somewhat educated and a little more adult than they are being well, it's interesting because, you know, there have been some of those opportunities and they just completely uh, ignore the lessons. So yesterday uh, in the oversight committee, there was a hearing called Kids in Camps um, held by the Democrat majority, obviously, to sort of demagogue the, the treatment of migrants at the border by the Trump administration. Uh, you know, and, and I've been outspoken and I know others have as well about the fact that these conditions have been terrible for years for years. The reason they're slightly worse now is simply because the numbers are higher than they have been in 12 years. And yet these Democrats refuse to give any additional resources to Border Patrol um, and to the Health and Human Services Department to actually care for these migrants. But case in point, uh, the pictures that the Democrats use to advertise for these hearings of the detention facilities of kids in cages and sleeping on the floor were pictures taken in 2014 under the Obama administration. And they unironically, they, they just didn't realize that they were using the wrong photos. But it just goes to show, uh, you know, that, that they are very aware, right, that conditions have been terrible for years. They're very aware they are blocking resources. They just don't care. And they, so it's hard to teach people a lesson who, who have zero interest in learning it. They have an amazing ability to just ignore the facts when they slap them in the face and they're, they're, they're post-it noted to their noses. No, it's absolutely right. And, it, and, and the willful ignorance is, is breathtaking on this issue. Uh, the hypocrisy is, is really without equal uh, on this particular issue. And you just, they continue to persist in, in acting like conditions up until this point have been dreamlike, that, that more, re- you know, they continue to complain about these awful conditions at the border. At the same time, blocking they blocked additional funding 17 times before they begrudgingly passed it alexandria ocasio cortez and her clique of of girls voted against it uh you know they they seem to not pick up on the irony of and they continue to complain about how bad conditions are with at the same time blocking uh, more funding to fix them I think that our little clique led by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez needs to take the, uh, what is it, the August recess that's coming up, and Mm -hmm. the four of them ought to go jump on a plane and go be part of Peace Corps so they can see how things really are in some of these countries um, that 
because that's really the core of the issue of all of these migrants, illegals, asylees, and refugees are fleeing. They're not fleeing because of persecution for whatever reasons. They're fleeing for economic reasons. And I would like to see them kind of go, you know, go do some a week's worth of work in, in Sudan or in, you know, Guatemala. <laughs> Can you get them on a plane for me? <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is uh, when you talk to people who are actually dealing with migrants on the border. You know, some of them are fleeing violence in their home country, but many of them, if not most of them, and these are based on interviews done at the border, they're economic migrants, and they know that if they show up with a child and they claim asylum, uh, they will be released into the interior of the country. It's a very easy way to get here. But most of them are coming for economic reasons, or they're coming for definitions, or for reasons that do not fit the definition of asylum and under our U.S. law. And you can argue that the definition should be more expansive, but then if that's what you want, then change, change the law. You know, these lawmakers have not changed our immigration laws. The current uh, law regime that the Trump administration is operating under is the exact same one the Obama administration is operating under. Uh, you see people in Congress stamping their feet in, in rage, tweeting about these these issues, uh, but they have the power to fix them, and they simply choose not to. Uh, Rachel, look, um, every president's administration, you know, these agencies, they put in these regulations, and regulations, I would argue, are some kind of laws that are not formal laws. They just, I mean, Obamacare had it, and the EPA has them, and so forth and so on. So when it comes to the asylum law, why can't we put in some regulations to kind of clean up the language that clearly says on these applic uh, asylum applications, if it is uh, on first review that they are here for economic reasons, then we, we just take those out. They don't even have to be reviewed. We automatically take them out. They've signed them and go, uh, this doesn't work. you got to go back. I mean, d has any talked about regulations when it comes to asylum law language? So the administration is very limited under the law, you know, of is by issuing any regulations. The, the initial screen when they come in, if these migrants claim asylum, and uh, they, many of most, if not many of them are, uh, they are entitled to a hearing in front of a judge. And the backlog is so intense that it takes mm -hmm. years sometimes to schedule that hearing. But there's no, and that is the statute, that is what the law requires. And there's very few ways for the administration to get around that. So we, we can't do any kind of stipulations or clean up the language or have some kind of committee where, you know, um, we refine text in the asylum law. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's right. Congress needs to change the law, and they have thus far been unwilling to do so. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> now we're seeing some kind of relief. We're hearing the rumors that there's some kind of relief a little bit. There was, what, 30,000 less that came across, you know, uh, the borders in the last, what, month, I guess, or since the, the 44 billion was, 45 billion was allocated. That's right. There is a small reduction uh, in crossers, which is pretty typical of the summer months when it's incredibly hot. Right. Uh, but there's also a little bit of reduction uh, thanks to Mexico finally getting on board, um, you know, and holding some of these migrants in Mexico while they await their asylum hearing. And this is a result of President Trump threatening tariffs on Mexico to get them to cooperate. This is the outcome of some of that. So you are seeing some reduction because of that. Some of these detention centers uh, in, uh, <laughs> are privately run, privately owned detention centers, correct? As opposed to all government, they're not all government facilities. They're, some of them are done on a, on a private basis, correct? That's right. Okay. So uh, we have the liberals, we have the progressives that are saying we don't want privately own privately want run prisons but it's okay for the detention centers <laughs> well i mean this is again because hhs and cdp do not have the resources they contract with private uh, private prisons which they're allowed to do under under federal law uh it's simply because they're out of space if if congress and democrats in congress don't want private prisons they're going to have to give cdp more money uh, and they are thus far refusing to do that. So, again, this is a problem of their own making that, that Congress, Democrats in particular, refuse to address. 
In your <clears throat> travels up and down the hallways on the Hill, are the Republicans, do they have some measures on their desk that they'd like to, you know, introduce or advance or get some co-sponsors to um, that would address some of these issues, but we're kind of stuck because the Pelosi House won't bring any, allow anything to go to committee? Uh, she'll allow them to go to committee, but they'll never get out. Um, yes. And there are Republicans that have plenty of bills and the White House would support them. Uh, in reforming the asylum process, um, you know, in in dealing with sort of the lack of resources that Border Patrol and HHS are, are confronted with, it would update the desperately needed asylum uh, detention laws. Uh, but again, Democrats and Congress, this is a non-starter for them. I mean, where we where they are in the Democrat Party uh, was uh, evidenced in the last debate. Uh, the second night when the moderator said, you know, who here would support decriminalizing border mm, crossing? Mm. And every single, all 10 Democrats on stage raised their hand. I mean, that is where the Democrat Party is right now. They have no desire for enforcement. Uh, that is definitionally open borders. And they only have plans uh, to legalize more uh, citizens here, or, uh, sorry, more illegal aliens here and make them citizens. They have no desire to do any kind of enforcement or border security. That is not even under discussion, uh, but from the Democrats running for president. So that should tell you that Congress is about in the same place. And so that into itself ought to ring some bells because that means that there are laws on the books they just simply won't support. But yet I haven't seen any of them come forward with any kind of measures to decriminalize, you know, illegal border crossers, right? I mean, is, is, is there some hypocrisy there? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the, some of those folks introduced bills now. I mean, many of the people running for president aren't in, um, you know, aren't in the Senate or in Congress. A lot of them are, but some of them aren't. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some if you saw some of these measures pop up now in the House and Senate. I don't think the Republicans were very good at the messaging coming out of that second debate. Do you? Uh, you know, it, it, I think everybody was caught a little off guard by how it's <laughs> the Democrat Party has become, to be totally honest. I mean, it, it really, these positions were sort of unthinkable for a mainstream party, you know, just even five or ten years ago. And now we have all ten Democrats in the second debate saying, yes, open borders. Uh, so I think that, you know, they hurt themselves to some extent because I think voters, a lot of voters, even moderate Democrats are, are in this position as well to be like, holy smokes, <laughs> this party has, has made a hard leftward shift. So by, de by <laughs> definition, there really is no such thing in, in the 20 candidates or 22, wherever we are, there is no such thing as a citizen or a citizenship anymore. That's really what the messaging is, correct? Yeah, you know, I think, and that's a, a consequence that I think not enough people are talking about is is that for the Democrats, there really isn't, you know, the fact of citizenship doesn't really matter to them as much anymore because they would, you know, it is not, you know, a, a value to be held or a position to be earned. We will just hand it out like candy to anyone who comes across our border legally or illegally. You know, between the work that um, the Conservative Partnership Institute is doing, uh, the Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, um, I mean, we can go on and on and on. Um, there's a lot of solutions here. You know, I, I talk to a lot of these people intermittently, certainly on radio, but I'm not seeing uh, traction, you know, such that uh, it... I mean, I, you, the only kind of traction we're seeing is a uh, Dan Crenshaw getting in a Twitter war with somebody, <laughs> you know, um, isn't it, isn't it time that, that some of these, um, outside organizations just invite a uh, Schumer and a Pelosi and say, come on over here and let, let us introduce you to what the real, what we're really trying to say. Can I mean, it, would it be prudent to, invite the enemy into the belly of the beast here? Yeah, I mean, if they'd be willing to come, you know, I think it would be helpful to hear where they think their party is going. But I don't know that, you know, it's a, they're in a difficult position. You're seeing Nancy Pelosi try to stand up to the progressive wing of her own party right now to say, hey, 
impeachment is not wise. Um, you know, we shouldn't be pushing these extreme positions on immigration. Uh, and, and the blowback has been intense. So, you know, it's a tough spot for her to be in. And I don't know that she relishes publicly opposing these groups. If you extend the invitation, and even, they, even though they say no, that into itself ought to be newsworthy. It's kind of yeah. like it, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the Fourth of July event, the Independence Day event in Washington, D.C. by Trump. If I were he, I would have invited, you know, Ocasio-Cortez and, and um, Ilhan Omar to sit next to him. You know, let them say no and just say, look, I'm, you know, I'm extending an olive branch here. I want them to understand what this is really all about. And they said, no, that would have been news for you. You see what I'm saying? I mean, let's let's kind of or or am I just kind of sitting out here in wishful thinking land? No, you know, I think that they the, the flip side of it is that they, you know, relish those opportunities to stick it to Trump. They do, you know, and their supporters do the same thing. You know, they they gain momentum when they publicly, you know, oppose the president. So, you know, the flip side of it is it would be giving them even more momentum in that regard. Well, you know, they would say no. Um, I mean, Nancy Pelosi is going to say no. She's invited over to the American Enterprise Institute, and they do a full-blown presentation to her on the cost of um, illegal immigration just over the last 10 years. I mean, she would clearly say no. And I think it would be very newsworthy to say, look, y- you know, you have these numbers, but we want you to know that we have them. And these numbers are here. This is what it's costing us. Um, and you have a, a particular responsibility in the House because there's where the power of the purse is. Um, just like on on block granting money into cities and states for sanctuary city status. I mean, there's so many millions of moving parts here, Rachel. Um, I I think we kind of need to look at a a new plan, and I'm just begging you to tell me a new one. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the cost is is a huge issue for Republicans, but it does not compel Democrats. They do not find cost. Of illegal, of illegal immigration to be a compelling argument. Um, they would prefer to spend more money uh, on that on that topic. So, you know, it's a it's a really it's a driver for Republicans who, who rightly, I, in my mind, point out, you know, hey, this is a we, we we can barely take care of our own folks, let alone you know not control the flow of immigrants coming into the border who are going to need services as well. But that that you know, look at California, where Gavin Newsom, the government of California, mm. is putting all uh, illegal immigrants in California on the state's Medicaid program. Um, that is going to be incredibly expensive. Uh, and, and I do not you know, know how the state is going to pay for it, but they, cost is not a concern for them. Well, that's another enticement. So because uh, Gavin Newsom did this, then what does that do to the national um, Medicare program? I mean, do, do they stop you know, certain monies or, I mean, what really happens there? I mean, I would think that the federal government's got some other triggers they can pull. I'm not even allowed to, that's not politically correct, but nonetheless, they've got some other arrows in their quiver that they can pull that, because, I mean, that just entices more activity, more illegalness going into California, and these people get to travel. That just doesn't mean they stay in California. They get to go to any other state. Um, no, that, yeah, that's right. Uh, unfortunately, Medicaid is a block grant program, and, it, you know, the government doesn't have, you know, policy things to say. The government isn't even cutting off money to sanctuary cities. Um, well, sanctuary that, that, cities are yeah. still getting immigration enforcement money to not enforce the law. Yeah, and that's that's in litigation, I think, now, isn't it? Uh, Democrats are pretty effectively blocked with something in the because it is stuck in litigation for who knows how many more years. I can't. Uh, there, <laughs> I can't think of anything that that Trump has tried to do that that the ACLU hasn't stepped in or somebody else hasn't stepped in, and it's sitting in court right now, which has put the skids on pretty much everything. So, um, I'm almost thinking that. Um, the rest of his agenda leading into 2020 is dead in the water. Is that overstating it? No, you know, that is, it's been a very effective strategy for Democrats to take Trump to court, although you know, they may not win over the census question. Uh, and that will be decided in the next couple of days. But 
you know, the Supreme Court recognized the president's ability to put a question about citizenship on the census. They said, you just need a better reason uh, than the one you gave. And so that's something that the White House is going to look into. But if they success, if they are successful in making a better argument, then there will be a citizenship question on the census, which is a big victory for the Trump administration. That was such a lame. I mean, why didn't they argue the right thing? Do we have a bad solicitor general here? I mean, something was very wrong with that argument before the Supreme Court, right? Yeah, and you know, and I'm not sure, you know, how it got to that point. Obviously, you have a lot of uh, career um, bureaucrats in the government, uh, many of whom didn't agree with the president's approach to this. So I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but there's a lot of attention on it now, and, and hopefully they can rectify the situation and make it an argument that the court finds compelling. Well, they're talking about doing an executive order, and that's I'm I'm fine with that. Uh, of course, that's going to be legally challenged. The census form itself has already gone to print, so it would necessarily go just to another piece of paper that would be attached to the census form. Correct? No, that's right. I mean, a lot of people making the argument that, that they should hold off on printing or print with the question in anticipation of of a positive court ruling. You know, because you don't want to have to have a printing hang up be the reason that the the question does not get asked Ah, so what is the what is the rest of the the month look like um in washington dc when it comes to all things immigration alexandria ocasio cortez and the census uh you know i it's uh, the washington is tied up in a spending fight right now uh that's probably gonna uh, tie up the remaining months before August. Um, you know, the, the they need to pass spending bills before the end of the fiscal year, which is in September, to avoid another government shutdown. Uh, right now, the dispute is unfortunately between Republicans. The White House wants a one-year continuing resolution, so a straight extension of funding. Uh, Senate Republicans, led by Mitch McConnell, would like to get a two-year deal that that drastically increases spending also runs the risk of allowing Democrats to really threaten some of the president's policies and some of the pro-life uh, issues, um, but that's their preferred solution. So they, they haven't come to an agreement on that, uh, but I think uh, that could be tying up the, the hill for a couple of weeks. Which is better, a one-year or a two-year? I would suggest that a one-year is better. It keeps spending at current levels rather than increasing it, and it doesn't give Democrats the ability to to try and negotiate away a lot of the gains the Trump administration has made on the on the deregulation front. Uh, that would definitely be at risk under a two-year deal. <laughs> so we could literally have a another government shutdown looming. Uh, I think both parties would like to avoid that, but right now, yeah, they have to have an agreement by the end of September to avoid. Um, is it all of August that they're on vacation? Um, I think that's right, correct? Yes. Uh, right now, that's the schedule. Okay. And so when they go on vacation, a lot of them, when they leave town, they also leave the country. They go to, you know, some crazy places, um, you know, just to do some foreign policy stuff or, you know, go do some diplomatic stuff kind of getting in the way. Um uh, how many do you think will end up in Britain and in uh, France or Germany on the Iran deal? Yeah, I'm not sure. They don't generally announce those trips too far in advance for security reasons, but I'm sure that there's going to be some attention paid to that issue and some some definite travel and negotiations over August. Do they generally, when they go on on recess, do they generally publish their little town hall sessions that? in advance um because i mean those certainly have to be scheduled such that people can go show up and start asking some harder questions yeah they they will announce them um maybe sometimes a week or two in advance um and that's obviously an opportunity to hear from constituents so um look for that if you're in, if you're in the district check your check your congressman schedule um, but I guess the cherry on the banana split before August recess is going to be the Mueller testimony. Is there chatter that that is going to happen or not going to happen? Yeah, it's scheduled to happen uh, next Wednesday, July 17th. Um, and I don't expect Mueller to say much more than he's already said, but the Democrats are very uh, 
highly anticipating that. So I think it's going to be kind of a circus, but it is still going forward. <laughs> so you, I would say you're going to be running up and down hallways like crazy. And, you know, you've got hundreds of topics you need to be covering. Um, is there a priority for you? Is it still on the immigration front or is it on budget front? Well, right now, since no one's doing anything about immigration, uh, <laughs> vehicle yeah, is, is the budget. Um, but obviously, I'm not going to stop paying attention to immigration. Oh, Lord. Um, well, uh, I guess the uh, Border Patrol has asked for more military to come down to the border so they can, I think, catch up. I think they asked for another thousand. Is that going to happen, do you think? Uh, I think so. If DOD says yes, you know, if, if, but again, this is a question for the spending bill. Democrats really want to use these spending negotiations in a two year deal to block the president from any more moves on the border, whether it be wall construction or military, moving the military around. Uh, and again, that's another reason that, you know, to avoid a two year deal and instead do a straight uh, one year extension of funding. And meanwhile, the entire uh, trade deal with China has kind of left the headlines. It's kind of been sidelined altogether. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the ball is really with the president on that one. Um, House Democrats are currently um, allegedly working with the White House to pass USMCA, which is the renegotiated NAFTA agreement. Uh, but it's Democrats have to be the ones to bring that to the floor in the House. I think uh, Mexico and Canada finally um, passed it last month in their legislatures. Yeah, that's right. It's it's waiting for approval here. So it's waiting just for the United States. Yes. Oh, goodness gracious, Rachel, you don't. Yeah, I think you might have the second worst job after Mike Pompeo. Is that right? <laughs> hey, I like my job still. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel very badly for uh, Pompeo. He, he's in a tough position all the way around, including a domestic front um, when it comes to dealing with Mexico and, and Latin America. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you like your job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to be writing some more because uh, 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 I, I know you've got experiences that are happening when you're running up and down the uh, halls of Congress that more is going on that you're not telling us about. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I do the best I can to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, we appreciate the update for sure. Uh, didn't even think about the whole budget thing. Uh, that that That's going to be a fight that I don't think we anticipated, but I'm glad you kind of gave us the warning on that one. Um, that That could be that could be very dangerous, but maybe we can get the uh, USMCA thing passed first. So, yeah, no, it would be great. All right. Thank you, uh, Miss Rachel Bovar, Conservative Partnership Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us on the Denise Simon Experience, and we'll see you again very soon.